Hi everyone, I'm Max Silverman, and I'm gonna start by telling you a story. I'm gonna tell you a story that most of you have heard before. Some of you have heard it from me, but more likely you've heard it from a friend, a family member, a coworker, and many of you in the audience will probably feel that this is your story too. When I was a sophomore in high school, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. She went through two mastectomy surgeries and nine months of chemotherapy. She lost all of her hair, and she spent weeks at a time living in a hospital bed, followed by months and months of depleted energy and limited activities. It was hard. She had trouble doing some of the most basic everyday tasks. She had three children and a then-husband at home worried sick about her. My mother, the strongest person I know, spent all of her energy every single time I asked, trying to convince me that she was happy to get a break, that everything was going to be totally okay. Still, it was easy for me to see that what she was going through was not easy. What she was going through was incredibly difficult, that her illness was challenging and painful, both physically and emotionally. Turns out, everyone else knew that it was pretty difficult, too. I will never forget the outpouring of love that my family received when my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. We had dinner made for us every single night for four months straight. We had a schedule on our fridge with who had offered to help us out with what on which day. Every time I got to school, I was welcomed with a hug from every single one of my friends. They would ask me, how's your mom doing? Is everything okay? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? And they'd offer me their shoulder to cry on at any point if I had ever needed it. When I mentioned to my mom how incredible this was, how proud she should be, how proud we should be to have such a loving and caring support system of friends and family, she just smiled and nodded her head. Where was this when we really needed it, she asked. Where was this when your brother was sick? Rewind four years. I'm in sixth grade. I wake up at 6.15 every single morning just so I can snooze the clock three times before I hop in the shower and run downstairs in time for a quick breakfast before the bus comes at 6.55. I shove down a couple toaster oven waffles and one of my parents mentions that it's time to get to the bus stop. We've got to get going. Wait, I ask. Where's Eli? Are you really going to let him get away with sleeping in again? My brother less than two years younger than I, wasn't downstairs. Mornings like this happened a couple times a week in my house at about this time in my life. Eli wasn't downstairs because, as far as I could tell, he was too lazy to move his feet and get out of bed and drag himself onto the bus and to school like the rest of us. The truth, of course, was far more complicated. At seven years old, my brother was my best friend, my, best friend, my absolute best friend in the entire world. We played imaginary games together. We went on adventures in our neighborhood, dug holes to China in our backyard. I loved him so much, I could not imagine that there could possibly be anyone more fitting to be my brother. We were absolutely inseparable. He was the sweetest kid. His mushroom cut and boundless positive energy <laughs> meant that, <laughs> well, I can tell you that directs, that tr <laughs> directly translates to continuous friends and constant adoration by adults and teachers all over the place. He was universally loved. At eight years old, my brother told my parents that he wanted to die. He ran away from home, he threatened his family, and he started having unprecedented difficulty at school with his friends and with his work. <sighs> my youngest brother, my baby, baby brother, you can see at the top of the stack up there, felt unsafe in our own house. And I blame my parents for letting Eli act out, for letting him get away with things that I thought were just unfair. What I didn't know was that on those very difficult mornings, my parents had already spent over an hour in Eli's room trying everything they could possibly think of to make sure that he was okay, to get him out of bed, and more importantly, just to see him smile. They had spent hours and hours that week and all other weeks at doctor's offices, therapist offices, trying everything they could think of to balance and rebalance medication, brainstorm new treatments, learn coping techniques, um, and just generally think of how they could possibly get through to their, their own son, how they could get him to listen to them. They tried to get, help him get through the next couple days and weeks and silently wondered whether he'd make it through the next couple months or years. Both of my parents are highly educated professionals, yet neither of them had a clue what to do when my brother was struggling with mental illness, especially when the school system we were in 
refuse to provide the proper support or adequate access to resources and information, my parents were absolutely lost. Ultimately, after years of searching for answers, my brother was finally diagnosed with severe bipolar disorder, depression, ADHD, and a web of related learning disabilities and processing disorders, a laundry list that he'll now tell you he's proud of. Throughout it all, we felt alone, utterly alone. We were alone. Most of my brother's fr closest friends stopped seeing him. Their parents didn't want them hanging out with a problem child. My parents lost some of their closest friends who decided that my brother's acting out must be the result of bad parenting. Others still didn't know what to say, didn't want the topic to come up in conversation just to show up empty-handed and slowly backed away, and others more spread rumors about our family, deciding that we had a crazy gene in us. My parents were at a loss. Without the support of their friends, their school, or me, they had to watch my brother struggle through a world that he no longer wanted to be a part of. They thought they had lost their son and had nowhere to go. No one brought us dinners. No one offered to help. No one stopped me at school to give me a hug and ask if I was okay, ask if he was okay. Nobody offered me their shoulder to cry on. Nobody. No one told my mom to snap out of it when she had breast cancer. The truth is, bipolar disorder, depression, mental illness, this is a biological condition. This is a medical condition. It's a disease of the brain. It's a chemical imbalance but it is not treated as such. The stark contrast between the support that my family received when my mother was ill and the lack thereof that we received when my brother was ill makes a powerful statement on its own. My brother's illness was invisible. It was highly stigmatized. My mom's was not. His illness was hidden behind layers of tantrums and locked doors, and my mom's was in the open. People visited her when she was sick brother got no visits. People don't plaster the country in pink ribbons for National Mental Health Day. There's no Protect Our Breasts campaign for mental illness. Instead, it's shoved behind closed doors and hushed. We don't know how to talk about mental health yet. Now, a decade after he was first diagnosed, my mother's breast cancer, my parents' divorce, a series of therapists, like psychiatrists, medication balances, and years living away from his family and the people he loved in residential treatment centers. After all of that, my brother has accomplished the impossible and graduated from high school. He owns his own small photography business, and he has been able to figure out how to channel his mania into intensively developing his business while producing some of the most beautiful pieces of art that I have ever seen. He's stepping outside of his comfort zone to travel the world next semester, and I am constantly in awe of the work that he has to put in to better understanding himself and his illness in order to fit into a world that he does not feel is his. That's something that it took me years to understand, that in Eli's words, you need to work double on your illness. You need to confront it on one hand while trying to fit in normally with it on the other. It took me years to understand that something like getting out of bed in the morning, something that was a small hill for me, might be a huge mountain for him. And it took me years to come to a place where I could support my own brother without questioning his legitimacy. I had internalized this stigma that we have in our society, the same stigma that prevents people who need it from getting treatment and support. If you think our community is immune, chances are you have not struggled with mental illness. Because if you have, you probably understand that powerful chemical signals in your brain can shut down your handle on reality. It can trick you into believing that life is not worth living. And they can trick you into believing that the entire world is built against you. You probably also understand that these same chemical reactions that stop you from being the person that you want to be are often interpreted by others as fundamental character flaws or personality weaknesses. There's a good chance that you live in fear of the power that words like melodramatic and psychotic have to delegitimize the entirety of your very real lived experience. And there's a good chance that when you're finally able to push through your illness enough to look up, the world you live in really is against you. In the past few weeks, since I've known that I'd have the chance to get up here, I've thought countless times 
about how I am not the best person to be giving this talk. There are so many people in our very own community who are really, really struggling and who get this on a level that I just do not. I know all too well what it's like to watch people that I love, many people that I love, struggle through mental illness. But the truth is I can't possibly know what it's like to have one myself. But there's a reason that I'm the one up here. There's a reason. It's a privilege, a privilege, that I am the one who is able to get up and talk about mental health while so many others are so afraid. In the two and a half years or so that I've been at Bates, in my work in mental health activism, as well as in my social life, I've had countless students approach me to tell me about this or that mental health crisis they're facing or this or that issue that they're struggling with. When I mention the health center, that our school provides access to therapists and counselors for anyone who needs it under any circumstances, they just nod their head. Absolutely not. I don't want anybody to know that I'm seeing somebody. I don't need a therapist. If you had a broken arm, would you go to the doctor? If you had diabetes or asthma or cancer? The hidden costs of having a mental illness at an elite institution like Bates are way too complex to fully explore here. But I would like you, for a moment, to just think about what it might be like to fall into an episode of depression the night before an exam or experience a profound panic attack before a big test you're taking. To wake up the next morning unwilling to face the world and too overwhelmed by anxiety to approach your professor. Then, when you finally get up the courage to have your professor tell you that you should have planned out better, you should have, you should have planned your schedule around this test so and then you would be able to take it. Your professor also tells you at that point that to be able to retake this exam, you need a note from the therapist that you wouldn't be caught dead seeing. When you come to your friends, try and get some guidance, some advice, you get up the nerve to talk to them about what you've been going through. They tell you you should have tried harder, you should have stayed up later studying, and then they criticize you for taking longer to do the same work. They berate you for not going out on weekend nights because you can't find the motivation to leave your room and you can't drink because of your meds anyway, so why bother participating in a culture that isn't yours? This is a reality here for so many people. I've seen it hundreds of times, and I'm sure many of you have as well. But it's not talked about. Not in public forums. Not in places like this. Ableism, which is the word for discrimination based on physical, emotional, or mental ability, runs rampant today, even at Bates. While we still have a whole lot of work to do. I'm really proud of the conversations that Bates often fosters on issues of race, class, gender, sexuality. I'm proud to be a part of community that is having these conversations. But I'm dismayed that ability and mental health rarely seem to be considered in public discussions of oppression or intersectionality. In spite of a system that politically, economically, and socially marginalizes people with mental illness on a systemic level, I ran a survey as part of a, a year-long study I did on mental health and community at Bates during my sophomore year. Um, and I'd like to share some of the results with you because I think they're pretty telling. Out of the 160 some odd people who responded to my survey, 94% overwhelming majority agreed with the statement that there's a heavy stigma surrounding mental illness today in America. Yet, we're divided about half and half on whether or not mental illness should be included in Bates' diversity non-discrimination statement alongside such categories as race, socioeconomic status, and sexual orientation. We can't come to a common conclusion on whether or not we believe people with mental illness should or shouldn't be discriminated against. When I asked whether people believe that parenting is a significant factor in the, behavioral of de of, in the development of behavioral disorder, we're hugely, spi huge, hugely split between people who agree, disagree, or just aren't sure, kind of ambivalent. And when I asked whether our own Office of Admission should take mental illness into consideration as an obstacle to success when selecting our applicants, we are equally split. Finally, when I asked whether personality weakness or character flaws can be the root of mental health problems, a whopping one in five Bates students either weren't sure, were kind of ambivalent, or straight up agreed that personality weakness or character, flaw can, character flaws can be the root of mental health problems. And overall, 
Respondents estimated that mental illness was a third less common than it actually is. This is the result of a society that stigmatizes and hushes mental illness and related mental health issues. At my high school, I tried to create a student club like Active Minds to combat the stigma surrounding mental illness. And it was unequivocally denied by my school's administration on the grounds that it was too touchy, that it would bring too many emotions to light, that it might leave people too, feeling too vulnerable. The irony. You can see, you can, you can imagine how frustrated I was after I heard back from my administration about that. About a year ago at Bates, I began a similar process of trying to start up Bates' chapter of Active Minds, which is a national network of college organizations that aim to fight this stigma and to bring this conversation that we're having right now out into the open. I ran into so much resistance in starting this club, so much friction between me and my peers and the organizational bodies in place to help me get this started that I very nearly gave up. What does this say about our community, about our larger community? When we finally got started in the spring, when Active Minds began meeting consistently, I was worried about the support we'd have. I wasn't sure whether or not students at Bates were ready, were willing to start talking about these issues. But we hit the ground running during short term, and we caught the attention and empathy immediately of Bates students from all walks of life. By October, we had 40 students showing up to every single one of our meetings. 40 students. Clearly people care. Clearly I am not alone in this. One in four Americans, 25%, struggle with a diagnosable mental health disorder. But 90% of these, I'm sorry, 90% of these are treatable. 90% of the one in four. More than half of them, though, go untreated. Why do you think this is? Mental illness does not cause violence. Lack of treatment, more importantly, lack of support, that causes violence. So how do we fight this stigma? How do we begin having this conversation that nobody's having about mental illness? First, we begin by having the conversation that nobody's having. We start talking about it among our friend groups, in our classes, every outlet we can find. We make sure that everybody understands that everybody at least is able to start talking. We start by being open and honest about how we feel. We stop blindly answering good to the question, how are you? And we stop normalizing the idea that emotional struggle is a form of weakness. The gendering of emotional and mental health is a conversation for a different setting, but I would encourage you all to think critically and intersectionally about the ways that we are taught that it is and is not okay to be emotionally vulnerable and the ways that this affects the cloud of stigma surrounding mental illness. Second, we think about how what we say impacts other people. That test you took the other day was not bipolar. Your friend who dropped the ball at practice last week is not retarded. And saying so delegitimizes the very real experience of the millions of people who live it every single day. Most importantly, we actively work toward a place where people are not discriminated against based on their mental well-being. Where allies understand how to be supportive and are able to actively reach out for help. And where those struggling aren't ashamed to ask for help. We check ourselves when we blithely assume that we know where someone's problems are coming from. And we recognize that we can never possibly understand what's going through another person's head under any circumstances. We offer our unconditional support to those we care about and encourage holistic, help-seeking behavior in every form. Only in embracing these differences, in destigmatizing mental illness, will we ever realize the transformative power of this invisible class of us that remains othered throughout our entire society. There are millions of people like Eli out there, like my brother, who are isolated from the empathy that they deserve. And ultimately, they're the ones who are going to pay the price of a society that continues to ignore them. What we need are allies willing to open their arms with love and support. Allies willing to reach out like they did when my mom had cancer. We need allies who are willing to actively rebel against a stigma that keeps so many feeling so alone. I look forward to this world where green ribbons and open conversation can replace the shame and the stigma that are so prevalent today. Thank you. <laughs>